All right, we'll be in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 will be the text, so you can mark it, but we won't be there quite yet, <laughs> as usual. Genesis chapter 4. God's agricultural enforcement. Those are some big words. Agricultural enforcement. In America, we have um, the United States Department of Agriculture, and they go around and make sure everything's being done the way it should be as far as buying and selling food and livestock and things like that. And agriculture is a very big necessity to a nation. If you can't eat, you can't live, and you can't have a nation. <laughs> so agriculture is important. And we'll see in the Bible, God considers it very important too. In fact, you're a farmer. We're all farmers. In Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Galatians 6, verse 7. He says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. It's taken for granted that you're a farmer. He doesn't even argue the fact. He just says you're going to sow something. Then he says, what you sow is your choice. It's up to you what you're going to plant. And right now, each and every one of us is preparing a harvest. We're planting something. The most basic principle of farming is this. You're going to reap what you sow. If you sow corn, apples aren't going to pop out. <laughs> okay? So you're going to get back what you put in. Furthermore, what makes farming a business is that you can take one seed, put it in the ground, and get a bunch of fruit, a bunch of whatever. So you're going to reap way more than you sowed. So if you start sowing wickedness, expect to reap wickedness and even more than you actually sowed. That's not God being unfair. That's God being fair. You understand it from planting a farm. It's that simple. In Luke 8, you don't have to turn there. You're familiar with the story. This is the parable of the sower and the seed. In that thing, he says that the seed is the word of God. So there he's comparing seed, God sowing, God doing some farming himself. He says the seed is the word of God. And then he goes through and talks about how the seed affects the field. Some people hear the word, they get the seed, but the devil is allowed to steal it. They don't really care enough, and it just doesn't stay in their heart and he steals it. That's the unsaved. He says, then some people hear it and they're unstable. They don't have any root. Temptations come along and it's more than they can handle and they give in to temptation. The seed's not going to remain. Okay, well a plant has got to have root in order to produce. There's a lot of Christians who are saved, but they don't have any root. So they don't produce any fruit. Some people hear and the opposite of temptations messes them up. It's the opposite. It's pleasure. It's the cares of this life, riches. Those things will hamper your growth as well. So that's God has set it up as farming is important. We understand that from the scripture. The first story we read about in the Bible after Moses, or after, not Moses, after Adam and Eve have been kicked out of the garden, the first story we read is about two farmers. Let's see it. Genesis 4, verse 4. Genesis 4, verse 4. It says, And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. But unto Cain, and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? 
And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Okay, let's look at some farming. The first thing we'll see is a wicked farmer. That's Cain. Cain was a wicked farmer. In uh, verse 5, we'll see the produce of a wicked farmer, what it produces. He says, but unto Cain, what's the next word? And. So we've got two things that God does not have respect for. Cain and his offering. The problem is Cain, not the fruit salad. Now, the fruit salad is a result of there being a problem with Cain. Wicked people produce wicked products. That's just the way it is. Now, that's not wicked if you used it right. But if you use it wrong, it's wicked. <laughs> every, just about everything that is abused nowadays has a legitimate use. It's just being used the wrong way. Many things. So what happens to Cain? Cain gets very mad. He says, very wroth. That's anger that's frothing. <laughs> Frothy anger. Man gets mad when God doesn't tolerate sin. It's that simple. When you read the Bible and he hits your problem, the first reaction is anger. Now, if you've got enough of the Spirit of God in you, he'll quelch that anger real quick. But if you don't, if you're just left open to the natural man, anger is the normal response. Because we don't want anybody telling us what we can and can't do. But when the Word of God does it, man in his natural state is going to be very mad. The next thing we see is an absurd response by Cain. Let's look at there. He says in verse 7, this is God talking, If thou doest well... Shalt thou not be accepted? That's an overture of peace. God's given him a positive way to remedy the situation. He shouldn't have a bad reaction to that, but he did. In verse 5, look at verse 5. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Our countenance tells a lot about what we think when we hear God's word, it's just natural. If you huff and puff and roll your eyes, that's your countenance telling on you. That's dangerous. God takes note of that. He did with Cain. And Cain, a lot of times we exhibit, we put a mirror on our heart with our face. When we have a, a strong reaction to what God says, like here, we angry because he told us to do something we didn't want to do, or he didn't like something we did. The face will show it many times. Genesis 4, look at verse 2. Let's get inside of Cain's mind for a minute. See what he's thinking. This is the way he was brought up. Genesis 4, verse 2. Talking about Eve. And she again bears brother Abel. And Abel, Abel was a uh, keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Okay. Uh, what did I tell you? Uh, verse 2. Okay, good. <laughs> Cain is going to remind us of some things. Both of them are farmers, but they do different industry in farming. If you were Eve, what do you think the occupation of Cain would remind you of? A garden. Hmm. That's something she liked. What do you think the occupation of Abel would remind you of? An animal that had to be slain to cover your sin. So, what does she say in verse 1? I've gotten a man from the Lord. And it's almost like you can see from the beginning, he's being propped up as this is going to be God's answer, and he's the special child. Now, I can understand her thought process, because before he kicked him out of the garden, he said, I'm going to produce a seed. And so the first thing she does is, I get a child. That must be the answer. But then she's answering for God. God didn't say, here's a man for you. <laughs> she said, I got a child. It must be a man from the Lord. So he's probably grown up thinking I'm special, like we talked about in Sunday school. 
And when you get that thought process, it ain't good. Right. You're not privileged. You can't just offer anything you want. You got to go by what God wants. Okay, that's what wicked farmers produce. Wickedness, anger, wrath. Um, look at the produce of a wicked farmer. Oh, I just told you that. The, <laughs> the produce. Let's look at the penalty of the wicked farmer. God's not going to let this thing just go away. God doesn't say, okay, you made me mad, but I give in. It's, okay, you're God. You can play God today. He doesn't do that. Never does God yield his position. He's not going to give his glory to another. That's right. That's what he says. Genesis 4, verse 7. He said, If thou doest well, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. This is interesting. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Now, I understand in context, he's talking about his brother Abel. However, in the sentence structure, it's talking about sin. A farmer is used to hard, long hours working in a field before he can reap any benefit from his labor. If you're a farmer, you've already settled that thing. It's going to be a lot of hard work, but it's going to pay off. Well, notice the change of 180 for Cain. Instead of having to work long, hard hours, if you don't do well, sin's just sitting right there at the door. No work required. Go pick it up. Hmm. Bad news. But hey, it's a lot easier than farming. It's a lot easier than trying to produce the fruits of the Spirit. That's something you got to plant and prune and work on and water. When sin's just lying there, go pick it up. And then he says something very interesting. And unto thee shall be his desire. So, we can go pick up whatever our favorite sin is. And we can control it. You know, a murderer gravitates toward murder. He doesn't gravitate toward grand auto theft. <laughs> okay, you can get whatever sin you want. And you can control it. That sin is what you want. The problem is you can't control your mind. That's controlled by God. You lose your mind, it, can, it uh, affects what you can control. If I'm driving a car, I can drive a car. However, if I'm drunk as a skunk, my mind is shot. And now I lose control of what I used to be able to control. Sin's the same way. You drive sin, but if you don't have a mind to drive it, your driving is erratic. And that's what happens. In Numbers chapter 32. Numbers 32 verse 23. Numbers 32 verse 23. He says, But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Yeah, it will. It's already sitting out the, outside the door. It didn't say you'll go find sin out. It says sin will find you out. In the spirit realm, the wickedness knows what your propensity is, what you gravitate toward, and it's going to come sit right outside your door. If you're given to that sin, you'll be readily available to you. You'll be able to find it with a quickness. Sin, he says, will find you out. And he means it. Look at a person's life who's been a sinner for a long time. Sin will find you out of resistance. Sin will find you out of hope. 
and sin will find you out of time. That's the way sin finds a man and leaves him. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 3, this is someone God used, Jonah. And he wanted to use him. Jonah 1 verse 3. Jonah 1 verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Isn't it amazing he found a ship going to Tarshish? He didn't have to wait around for one. He didn't have to ask around. He didn't have to change ships. You know, what didn't find one going to Crete and then have to hop on one from Crete to Tarshish? No, he found one, a direct route, one way to the other side of the world. Just happened to be sitting there, right outside his door. Whatever sin you're looking for, you'll be sure to find. you got to control your desires. That's what God was telling Cain. Hey, boy, it's not about the fruit salad, it's about you. What's your desire? In Psalms chapter 10, verse 3. Psalms 10, verse 3. And this is natural. We talk about what we like. Psalms 10, verse 3. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Ugh. Your mouth starts talking, and pretty soon we know exactly what's in your heart. Because you're going to talk about the things you like and the things you want to have, what you desire. And he says, a wicked man desires wicked company. He says, you'll start talking about the covetous, the people God abhors, because that's your desire. Your mouth tells on us. Your mouth tells on you. Our mouth tells on us. <laughs> I need to go back to English. <laughs> Psalms chapter 78. Psalms chapter 78, verse 29. God is good. There's no way around that. He's so good, he gives us what we think we want when he knows it's not what we need. If our desire is for things instead of him, sometimes he'll just give us things. Here it is, Psalm 78, verse 29. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire, and they were not estranged from their lust. But, while the meat was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Kind of like Cain. They thought he was the special one. Mm. Be careful. In Psalms 140, verse 11. Psalms 140, verse 11. He says, let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Sin is a predator on the prowl for an easy prey. If you've already decided my heart's desire is this or that sin, that sin is going to come find you. In the spirit realm, you've put out a call that can only be answered by that sin. And it'll come running. In Psalms 145. Psalms 145, verse 16. David talking about God. Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth, satisfieth the desire of some people of every living thing. That includes animals, trees, <laughs> humans, pagan, or Christian. He gives them their desires. We've got to be careful what our desires are.
Proverbs 13, 21. He says, evil pursueth sinners. There's a pursuit. There's a lot of happiness and joy in being a Christian. A real one. <laughs> now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work and worry and stress in being a fake one. Because that's, how is everybody going to view me? But when you're being a Christian just led by God and just wanting to please Him, there's fullness of joy because you'll be in His presence. Okay, so that's joyful. However, we can't ignore the fact there's still a war going on. This Christian life is a warfare. Right here he tells you, evil's pursuing you. Yeah, there's a war going on. In Isaiah 3.11, he says, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. Hmm. Reward is something you've earned. He said a wicked man is earning something. The crop is coming in. And he's going to get it. In Romans 2 verse 9, he explains this crop. He says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Of the Jew first and also the Gentile. Nobody is... Ex is in an exception category. <laughs> Jew or Gentile, everybody gets this. If you're going to pursue evil, count on it, tribulation and anguish of soul. That's universal. It's a fact. Now, it might be universally ignored, <laughs> and a lot of times it is. You can see a person who is anti-God and, you know, hates everything to do with God, and you can see God begin to work in his life and destroy everything he touches. And you can go up to him and explain it to him. Unless he wants to see it, he won't see it. <laughs> it's the desire of the heart. What are you looking at? In Genesis 4 again, Genesis 4 verse 12. Here's how it came back to haunt Cain. Remember, Cain's a tiller of the ground, and he's a farmer, and he was doing such great farming, he thought this would be a perfect gift for God. Here's what happens when sin is done with him. Genesis 4.12 When thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So sin doesn't actually pay what you think it's going to pay. For Jonah... He paid the fare to get on the boat, but he didn't realize once he was on the boat, he was still going to be paying. He was going to be paying all the way until he got to Nineveh and start doing some preaching. And even then, he didn't get his attitude right. <laughs> uh, no, he didn't make it to Tarshish. Okay, let's, those are all negative things. I got to give you something positive or Joel Osteen will get mad at me. Um, <laughs> the plenty of a worthy farmer. God does just the opposite to the worthy farmer. Now, how do you get in that category? Let's look at it. There's a subtle difference between the, those that God accepts and those that God rejects. Genesis 4, look at verse 4. Genesis 4, verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering and to his offering but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect God's decided there's something about Cain I don't like God does that God decides who he likes and who he doesn't like now of course it's based on our he calls first and then it's based on our response and then he'll make a response here, he didn't like Cain. Notice the similarities. They're both born of the same parents. They're both brothers. They're both farmers. One farms with lambs. One farms with land. They're both worshipers of God. And they both bring a sacrifice for God. One's accepted. One's rejected. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58, verse 10. Isaiah 58, verse 10. 
this is a great chapter and it gives you um, it gives you a good picture of modern Christianity so-called Christianity um, people doing things and thinking that's going to please God when it doesn't and that's what we got Cain here he's doing some things and he thinks oh God will just accept this but God's already got it lined up exactly what he'll take and what he won't and I'm looking for a passage but my Bible ain't moving let's see <laughs> okay we're in Isaiah 58 look down at verse 10 he says Isaiah 58 10 if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as noon the noonday the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy th thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not a lot of water water <laughs> sounds like we had a uh, McCall and she loved water and she would let you know she was always saying water 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 <laughs> that means come give me some more water <laughs> that's almost what this verse is saying water 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 God's gonna give water and you're going to be a garden okay Cain's garden he didn't want to water anymore he said I'm done with you I gave you a choice sin was lying at the door and you chose to commune with sin instead of me look at Ezekiel Ezekiel 33 verse 31 the one God accepts is the one whose heart and hand are connected in Isaiah there he was saying, if you'll feed the hungry, if you'll go do something, if your actions and your heart are connected, God likes that. If your heart is one thing and your actions are another, you're a hypocrite, guess what? God don't like that. <laughs> Ezekiel 33, verse 31. And they, came unto, uh, and they came unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee, as my people ouch that's a condemnation he doesn't say they sit before thee my people no as my people he's already rejected them and they hear thy words but they will not do them for with their mouth they show much love but their heart goeth after their covetousness deeds without devotion just Playing a game doesn't fool God. Showing up in a church service doesn't give you any brownie points with God if the heart's not here. Reading your Bible, if it's done so you can check off the, the checklist, oh, I read this so many verses today. Don't fool God. If you're not reading it to hear God and you've got your heart in tune with your eyeballs, <laughs> then it doesn't matter look go back a few chapters chapter 18 verse 25 Ezekiel 18 25 Ezekiel 18 25 this is a common excuse given yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal it's not fair here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Okay, you're seeing it from the wrong side of the seesaw. <laughs> the problem is, we don't have a good enough perspective to know what's fair and not fair. We're looking at it from a temporal standpoint. God's looking at it from an eternal standpoint. And he says it is fair, it is equal. The common excuses that are given is is not fair or everyone else is doing it why can't <laughs> this just just this one time is not going to hurt anything or i can stop anytime i want to how come nobody who could stop anytime they wanted to stopped when it was time to stop the mind goes god controls the mind ezekiel thirty three seventeen. He's already preached to them. He's given them 
God's information. He's told them, God says that everything is going to work out right if you follow me. What I'm saying is balanced from the viewpoint of eternity. What you think is balanced from the world's viewpoint is off skew. Ezekiel thirty-three seventeen. You children of the people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. They're still saying the same line. <laughs> the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. The problem is, a man who's not doing right doesn't want to line up with what God says is right. It's hard to, to turn a car that's not moving. You've got to turn the thing on, and if you're moving down the road, then you can turn the steering wheel and the wheels will move. It's the same spiritually. If you're not doing right, you're probably not going to come to the light. But when you'll start doing right and it's connected to your heart, then more will come. In John 3.21, he says it this way, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. That'll separate you from the rejected and put you in the category of the accepted. In Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58, and we'll close with this. Isaiah 58. This is a great chapter. Um, go through it sometime. Yeah, it is. And in here he's going to talk about them fasting the wrong way, and they're putting on all of these shows, and God's not impressed by it. And then he gives them an answer at the end of it how they can impress him. Isaiah 58, 2. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Doesn't all of that sound good? It sure does. If we, if we could just get some Christians to do that. <laughs> Let's, you know, it would be great if we could get some into the rejected category. <laughs> Christianity is so far from God now that we would be happy to see some people fake it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but God's not impressed by all the action because the attitude is wrong. Look down at verse 7. Between, well, between verse 2 and verse 7, he, he rebukes them about fasting for the wrong reasons. In verse 7 he says, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou bring the poor that are cast out, of thy, uh, out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, when thou hide, uh, and that thou hidest not thyself from thine own flesh. He's saying, I want to see some action in reality. Not just down here at the temple, where it's all pristine and pretty. I want to see it on the weekdays, not just on the Sabbath day. Verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth. We already covered that verse. Drop down to verse 9. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Ooh, that's a good thing. He's just given us a formula to get God's attention. He said, if you'll start doing these things in the real world instead of just for show in the temple, then I'll take note when you need some help. That's what we want. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, who's saying that? God's the one who's going to say this. Here am I. Whoa. Do you see that? That's what Samuel was supposed to say before the Lord. Now God's saying it back to a man. I'm here. What do you need? That's, what, that's a promise you want to claim there. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity... So, to be a worthy farmer, it requires actions. But the action's not enough, just a big beautiful field isn't enough if the field doesn't produce anything. So, we've got to connect the attitude with the actions, and there's a great reward to it. Not only does the fruit come out, but God becomes um, respectful to you. That's what he said over there in Genesis 4. He respected Abel. And he did not respect Cain. So when somebody you respect speaks, you listen up. 
You want to get God's ear? There's the answer to it. Come ye sinners lost and lonely Jesus' blood can make you free For he saved the worst among you When he saved